Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the PCI Adjudication and Liability Panel at the Net Diligence Conference here. Uh, we're excited to be talking to you about these issues. Um, <clears throat> just, uh, start out uh, right now, I think, in the, in the payment card world uh, with respect to security and liability, uh, the word is shift. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of shifts in a lot of different areas in this space, including uh, not only shifts uh, on the liability and, and security side, but actually shifts in how payments are actually being processed and, and new methods for, for processing payments. And so we're going to talk about these shifts here today and give you an idea of what the risks look like now and what they might look like going forward uh, from security and liability point of view. Um, we have a great panel to do so today. A lot of people that are in the industry who have uh, handled credit card breaches or uh, been involved in a, directly with the payment processing activities. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the panel. My, my name is David Nevada. I'm a, a lawyer at Norton Rose Fulbright. I do a lot of data breach work um, and uh, a lot of credit card data breach work, in fact. So I've been uh, able to see how these processes and, and security risks and liabilities have worked themselves out over time. And um, it's been very interesting. I'm going to let the rest of the panel introduce themselves. Uh, and we have another Dave on the left there, Dave Molitano. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks, Dave. My, my name is David Molitano. I'm a senior vice president at One Beacon Technology. I've been underwriting cyber liability for 15 years, at least. I'm David Heron. I'm general counsel for HyperWallet. Uh, we are a global payments provider specializing in uh, payout distribution uh, in 170 countries and as many currencies. Uh, and I've spent 12 years prior to that uh, at Vantive, a uh, very large merchant acquirer. And I'm Chris Dave Novak, um, as I'm the only person who's not a Dave on the panel. Um, and uh, I'm with Verizon. Um, for folks who were here yesterday, um, you might have heard me talk a little bit about some data breach aspects um, at that time. My team oversees investigations around the globe as it relates to both PCI and other forms of data breach and data theft. All right. Thank you, everyone. So in terms of our discussion today, just go through the roadmap here. We're going to start off talking about alternate payment systems and mobile payments and what they look like from a security and potential liability point of view. We're going to uh, jump into the EMV liability shift and, and describe uh, what happened as of October 1st of this year with respect to potential merchant liability and, and some of the incentives car brands are putting in place to encourage EMV adoption. And then finally, we're going to talk about the uh, third party liability uh, ecosystem. Uh, as we discuss some of these matters, I think you'll start to realize that it's not always the merchant who uh, is ultimately the problem here. It's oftentimes a third party who may have uh, caused the breach or been responsible for the breach on some level. And we're seeing a fair amount of new activity with respect to those third parties. So let's jump into it. So David Heron, we'll let you start off. Uh, you used to be, work for a processing company. You're in the payment business now. Can you tell us a little bit about mobile payments and the alternate payment systems we're seeing and describe how they work for the, for the audience? Yeah, so we were, we were mentioning before, Dave was mentioning before about this uh, you know, shift that's occurring. And one of those areas of shift we're seeing is uh, different uses of, or different interaction points between uh, a card holder and a merchant. And one of those is mobile. And a lot of press we've seen out there with Apple Pay um, was released uh, late last year. Uh, most recently, Samsung Pay, you've seen probably a lot of advertisements about that. Uh, and Android Pay, which is just sort of the repackaged Google uh, wallet. And all of these really, they're, they're minor variations in how they work, but basically they use uh, NFC technology to, uh, you know, proximity to bring your phone that has credentials on it, we'll get into that in a second, uh, to talk to the POS terminal and, and start the transaction. Um, Samsung ha has you know, some additional functionality, too, that allows it to sort of mimic a mag stripe. But really, they all kind of work the same, where you put the phone in close proximity to uh, the POS terminal. Um, <clears throat> what's important to remember about these is they all still ride the same uh, transaction rails that a physical card does. So the, uh, the transaction is kicked off by having an interaction with the POS terminal. The terminal then speaks to the merchant processor, who then sends it to Visa or MasterCard or one of the other card brands, then sends it to the bank and then authorizes it and it comes back down the chain uh, 
uh, and the authorization uh, is approved. So it runs the exact same rails. What makes these different though is the manner in which the device uh, holds the credentials for the particular card. And in that case, uh, the way these work is through tokenization. And I think that's a really important point that you're gonna hear today uh, about that uh, because it does make these methods more secure. Just a quick question. So just what's the process? I haven't done Apple Pay yet. What is the process for you know, giving your card data over to Apple and just get a general idea of how it works so the yeah. audience can know? So when you want to open, when you want to use Apple Pay, you take, and I'll just use them as the example, but the other ones work very similar. Uh, you'll take a image capture of your card. That card is then sent to what's called a token service provider, Token Vault. And those token service providers are actually Visa, MasterCard, Amex. They will receive that PAN data and return back to the phone um, a token. And that token is what's stored on the phone. So the card holder, the phone, person holding the phone, never has uh, the card data stored on the phone. When that phone is then used to initiate a transaction, it, t it speaks to the POS terminal, presents the token, the token is then presented to the processor who sends it to Visa, recognizes it as a Visa uh, token, untokenizes it, and then sends it to the issuer, and then the authorization takes place all the way back. So the merchant never has access to the actual card data, and the cardholder doesn't have that in their phone. And when you add on top of that uh, fingerprint identification to open your phone, it adds even, an even stronger method of authentication. But the key is, the card data that would otherwise be available in a physical MagStripe swipe that we all do today uh, doesn't exist because you have this token that's virtually useless to uh, anyone if uh, any of the bad guys if they got a hold of it. So just to be clear, so when you when you sign up for one of these payment systems, you, you provide them the cardholder data. It's no longer stored on your phone, so you lose the phone, you don't lose your card. Uh, and the merchants themselves never actually receive a credit card number when you actually do the, uh, put it near the uh, terminal at the, at the site. So the yeah. merchant and never touches cardholder data at all right. in that payment and, and nor does Apple, Samsung, or Google. That's, that's a, a common misperception you hear is, well, Apple has all this card data. Well, they don't. They didn't want it. They specifically set this up for this information to be tokenized. Who has it is the token service provider in this case. The example we're using is Visa. Now, that, that creates an aggregation question about whether or not the bad guys know to go to the token vault, the token service provider, and try to get the data from there. But the common point of compromise has been merchants and some of those systems, which in this case, they wouldn't have the data. So, so question to Chris on the security side. Are, are, is this system, is it ultimately more secure uh, in many ways? Um, and how does this tokenization process compare to tokenization at the point of sale terminal, just to make sure we're clear on that issue? Sure, yeah, excellent question. So, at the end of the day, I would tend to say that it is more secure in the sense, as, as other Dave mentioned, um, that the merchant ultimately is not coming in contact with the PAN data, right? And the majority of the breaches that we see at the end of the day, the big problem is a merchant has a breach. The breach results in some threat actor getting access to millions of credit card data records and then is able to use those for fraudulent transactions. In this case, obviously, the merchant does not have the PAN data. Um, so arguably it is, it is more secure. In terms of how it differs from the tokenization you might hear about from a merchant, in terms of, you know, a merchant might say, oh, I already do tokenization on my point of sale system. The tokenization that typically happens there is, it's not too dissimilar from this process, but the biggest difference is, instead of them using a third party like Visa or MasterCard or Amer American Express to tokenize the data or create the token, the mm. merchant themselves are doing that. And while that's good in a way in that it eliminates how many systems in their environment actually have to touch live card data because they're mostly using a token, the downside from a security standpoint is they themselves are doing the tokenization, which means they essentially, kind of if you use an analogy, they essentially have their own token vault internally that they're usually using to tokenize that data. Um, or they may be working with a, a merchant processor that may be working with them to tokenize the data, but still there are systems within their environment that are actually coming in contact with the actual live credit card data. So a couple of the, the I will take, I'll take questions in a little bit, thanks. A couple of the main problems that we see uh, kind of in general in the credit card world is uh, point of sale type attacks, memory scrapers that are getting the card data in real time essentially before uh, any kind of, before it's being sent to the processor. 
And then we have online breaches where companies are breaking into shopping carts and other types of uh, applications and getting into uh, websites and stealing card data that way. Uh, so does Apple Pay and some of the to uh, m mobile payment systems, do they, do they address both those problems in essence? Or um, is there still an issue in terms of online fraud that could arise of an Apple Pay uh, type of situation or a mobile, uh, mobile payment type situation? Sure. So when you're talking about it from the, um, I guess, from the NFC standpoint, the, the fact that you simply take your phone and put it near the point of sale register to conduct the transaction, you don't really have an equivalent for that when it comes to the e-commerce side. So that's, you know, when you, when you actually go to a physical retail store and buy something, that's typically called a card present transaction because you're actually presenting your physical card to the retailer versus what's referred to as a card not present transaction, which would typically be something like a phone-based transaction or an internet-based transaction, something along those lines. Um, in those scenarios, in those kind of card not present scenarios, you don't have that same level in terms of you don't have the, the tokenization elements that are happening. Generally speaking, you're physically entering in a card number, an expiry, and a, a CVV2 value in order to conduct the transaction. So that's generally different. Um, the only exception I would add to that is if you're using something like a mobile wallet, like a Google Pay or something like that, where then that kind of brings into a kind of a, a separate angle. So great. Question to, to Dave Malatano. Um, so, Let's assume over time there's some adoption of, of this payment method. Are, are, are merchants off the hook, uh, uh, at least on the point of sale level? Are they a better risk now uh, from an underwriting point of view? Are you, are you considering uh, adoption of these types of payment systems in your underwriting process? Uh, that's a good question. So just a little bit of uh, a background. So I'm taking a look at this from an underwriter carrier point of view. So. Um, the underwriting point of view has been a bit jaded in the last couple of years. We've, our, our checkbook has been used a lot uh, and, and with a lot of zeros after it. So just, so my point of view of looking at this is, is, is someone who handles claims on behalf of uh, half of our clients. So are, are merchants off the hook? Um, technically, yes. Right? So we, we can go through, um, you know, we'll go through the scenarios, but um, a caveat to all that, it, you know, as of last week, you know, I can give the background, all right? So as of last week, October 1st, uh, the PCI standards have changed where merchants in card present uh, transactions have less liability or could have more liability. So to answer your questions, are, are they better? Um, it, it's still yet to be determined, but I think in a few years they will be better risks when a lot of these... Uh, a lot of these precedent handling um, incidences are, are, are completed. So Dave Heron, kind of the same question. Uh, are, you know, one of the epidemics of, of data breaches, or credit card data breaches here in the United States, if there is adoption, does it solve that? And what are the obstacles to adoption on a wide scale basis? Yeah, so you know, this is kind of dovetailing off of what Dave was just saying in terms of you know, they'll, these merchants may be more off the hook or be de-risking themselves over the course of time, and that's really a reflection of how quickly adoption will take place. And, um, you know, we're, we're all just creatures of habit, ultimately, and, and it's very easy still today to pull out a card and swipe it and move on. And that's, that's such a, you know, a routine um, activity for all of us. It's tough to sort of uh, change that and, and remember that you're also holding a phone in your hand and that has a different way of potentially interacting with uh, a POS terminal. So adoption's been a little bit slow just because of uh, breaking some of those habits. Um, you know, it's, it's just too easy to, to pull out your card sometimes and swipe it. And, and then you've got the merchant on the other side who is used to a very standard looking transaction where a person walks up, pulls out card, swipes card, gets their goods, walks on. Pulling out a phone sometimes, depending on the POS system, um, often requires maybe a couple of extra buttons to be pushed, and that means you have to train somebody sitting at the register to do that. So all these little you know, nuances end up affecting um, the uptick in adoption. Um, but as millennials continue to age and become more affluent, um, they're, e they're early adopters of this sort of technology. Um, I, I think you'll see that start to hockey stick up a little bit in terms of adoption, and as a result, you'll have uh, you know, more de-risking of merchants by these technologies. That, that's an excellent point. I, I, I think the, the age of the user determines, can determine um, uh, uh, the use of it. So as, as 
the generations get older, things become more habits. So I think that's an, ex that's an excellent point. So, Dave, do you think you know, we've got three or four mobile payment systems online? There are probably more coming online. Are we going to have a terminal with 20 different, or, you, know, you go to the store and there are 20 different things you need to like, put your phone up against uh, to get a payment through? Or some, is there going to be some sort of standard where we end up with like four companies, like the credit card companies? Uh, we have like one kind of common payment method. For yeah, that. It, it'll be more standard. I mean, I, I think what you've seen across these three, whether it's Apple, Samsung, or Android, is they're all still using um, you know NFC technology to interact with the POS terminals. They're still the same you know big players in the terminal manufacturing space. Um, you know, they're coming out with terminals that then have the ability to accept this NFC um, interaction, and you know I, I don't think that's going to change. So. From the user standpoint, it's you won't really notice it. It'll just be your phone, and then it'll speak to the POS terminal, um, you know, and it'll it'll just take place that way. So I, I don't think you're going to have a, a plethora of, of new different types of devices out as you go through your checkout. You, most people probably won't, wouldn't even notice it. And so, Chris, to kind of put a dovetail on the point, we we, we have a, probably a more secure system in terms of the credit card being handled on the device and not being provided to the merchant. Are there other methods or attacks that we should be worried about now uh, based on this new system? So I think probably the, the most interesting thing that comes with any new technology, any new systems, especially when it relates to payment card or payment information, is the fact that it draws new attention from the folks who want to get access to it, right, for nefarious or malicious purposes. So I think there's a lot of areas where we probably have yet to determine what some of those risks and vulnerabilities might be. Um, but I think there's no question there's the aggregation elements of it. There's the fact that you're going to have some of these groups that are going to potentially focus more on things like your visas and MasterCards or more on your banks or attempting to find weaknesses or vulnerabilities in the actual application or the enrollment process um, in trying to find some way to get access to that data because you're never going to see the attack stop. It's just going to be a question of how we mitigate and contain you know, the actual events themselves when they occur. And I think to the, the conversations earlier about adoption, I think uh, I, I read an interesting article, I don't know when it was, but um, about people noticing that they lost their phone. And they said that on average, most people realize they've misplaced their phone within about six minutes. It usually takes people about eight hours or more to realize they've lost their wallet. Um, so I think that tells you a lot, right? And, and so it goes to the adoption piece of eventually I think you're going to get to a point where it's going to become second nature because your phone is probably already in your hand when you're checking out. And so it's going to become more convenient to just say, ah, you know what, why put my phone down to get my wallet out? I'll just pay with my phone. So hopefully then all the insurers in here will not have to pay those huge PCI fines and penalties that are going forward. Okay, now we're going to talk about the EMV liability shift, which again is another shift in technology, a shift in uh, liability, and a shift in risk. Um, and uh, it's timely because on October 1st, the EMV liability shift uh, went into play. And so we're going to talk about what that means and how it impacts uh, merchant risk and ultimately uh, carrier risk as well. So Chris Novak, um, can you tell us what an EMV is? Give us the overview and, and how it works and uh, how it compares to, to MagStripe uh, with, from a security point of view. Sure. So I'm not sure how many people realize, but the, the credit cards that you probably have in your wallet, they all have that MagStripe that you all know on the back of the card, and that technology is probably 30-plus years old, right? That may surprise folks, but that's been around since the beginning of credit cards. Um, that technology is being replaced by EMV, which if you've seen, you've all probably received one by now from your bank, and it's, it looks just like your existing credit card. It still has the mag stripe on the back, but you'll notice it's got a little chip in the front that you can see. Um, that chip basically has data and applications on it that instead of the traditional swiping of your card, you'll hear people say, you don't swipe it anymore, you dip it. And so instead of the swipe, there's actually a little slot you stick the card in so that the system can read that chip and you let it sit there for a couple of seconds while it reads the chip and that authenticates that the card is real and it's not counterfeit. You know, a lot of what we saw previously with breaches and fraud, the issue was someone would break into a merchant, they'd steal the data that essentially is equivalent to what's on your mag stripe, and they would take it, and there were huge factories all over the world that we've, we've busted as part of the investigative process, where they would actually manufacture fake credit cards with that mag stripe, and they would take the stolen data they got from a merchant environment, encode it on the mag stripe, and then sell the cards for people to use to commit fraudulent transactions. With the chip, that becomes much more difficult because now you have to manufacture a card, manufacture a chip, and then you have to try and find a way to encode the data, which essentially you don't have. So it reduces the counterfeit 
uh, possibilities as it relates to those transactions and ultimately uh, makes that data and that, that transaction information less valuable for someone to try and steal and counterfeit. And so um, I think in Europe and, and overseas, this technology has been adopted uh, pretty much across the board. Yep. What has been the lag here in the United States? What, why, why are we taking so long to put this into play? Sure, yeah. So the biggest reason I think pretty much anybody will tell you is it was typically would come down to cost. Um, so the U.S. market has got, I mean, you walk into any large box, you know, retail organization, and you'll see they probably have dozens, if not more, point-of-sale systems, and probably ones in a back storage room you don't even know, right? Um, so the problem was the billions and billions of dollars. I mean, I talked to a lot of folks, and they basically said as much as it would cost to replace all this technology, for some of them, they would come back and say, you know what, it's easier for us to eat the losses and the liability because it's less than actually going out there and replacing all the technology. And it's not just the stuff that you interact with on the front end at a retail store, right? That's just what the retailer would need to replace. It's then all the back end systems, systems that have to receive the data. It's all the systems at the processor side that the merchant talks to and everybody down the line. Most people don't realize that when you swipe your card, that data may change hands, say, 10 times and then has to change hands 10 times back to get back to the merchant where the receipt prints out saying the transaction's good to go. Everybody along that way needs to upgrade their systems to be able to deal with this kind of different transaction information. So the biggest, the biggest delay in the U.S. really came down to being cost, and now ultimately the rest of the world has gone on board, and so the U.S. is pushing essentially to kind of equalize that. So right now the, the issue that we traditionally saw in the U.S. was because the U.S. was lagging, the U.S. became a hotspot for targeting for breaches because we were using the older technology. Now with this new deadline, basically that shifts the liability, so anybody who has not upgraded, you now own a much more significant chunk of what those breach costs are. So that's forcing people to kind of up their game um, such that that's no longer kind of the soft spot in it. And kind of interestingly, when you look at the trends and the breaches that we saw, you, know, you mentioned that you know, Europe and Asia and even Canada um, has significant adoption, if not near 100% adoption of EMV already. They have, I don't want to say none, but almost no card present fraud or breaches um, like we see here in the U.S., largely because that data almost is non-existent in terms of what's used in their, their point of sale systems. The difference though is it doesn't mean breaches have disappeared. It does mean though that breaches have changed. So where normally you would see the big breaches in the news being a retail store got hacked and it was the card swipe data that got stolen, now a lot of what we find happening in Europe and Asia and places where it's been significantly adopted is that we see a lot of card not present breaches. So we see things like e-commerce and website breaches where people are stealing essentially the hand entered information. I think there's also an adoption issue that's similar to the mobile payments. Um, I have a client who uh, does stadium concessions and we were talking about EMV and of course the cost of the machines and the terminals, all, that was all part of it. But during the seven inning stretch when people are coming out to get beers and hot dogs, they want to be able to swipe and have that transaction be done in two or three seconds. With the dip, it was taking five to seven seconds and over hundreds of millions of transactions, they could actually quantify how much that delay would cost them as an organization. So uh, the, the customer experience may also be a factor that companies have been uh, wary of in terms of adopting this technology. Um, let's talk more, a little bit more about the security aspects and shift, and I think uh, Chris started to get into that, but I want to make the point clear, because I think there's a misconception that EMV suddenly means that the merchant uh, is no longer subject to kind of a security breach risk. And I think that is not true. They may be eliminating a certain type of fraud, but there is a, they're still subject potentially to another type. And then Dave, can you explain that in a little more detail? Chris sure. went into it, but uh, we'll make sure that the point is made. Yeah, the key, the key point is that EMV is an anti-fraud solution. It is not a security solution. And what we mean by that is, is as Chris Dave was saying, um, is that the credentials for creating a fake card uh, are, are virtually non-existent uh, in an EMV environment. Um, however, that doesn't mean that the card data does not exist through the transaction all the way down to all those 10 players that Chris was talking about. Um, that all that data is still there. It's simply a stronger authentication method that takes place at the terminal when the card is dipped into the terminal to identify that this card is a legitimate card associated with that particular card holder. The card data though is ultimately still there and could be um, breached throughout that entire chain. In addition, merchants are still accepting card, uh, card swipe transactions today. 
So just because you're EMV compliant doesn't mean you're not accepting card data from a swipe transaction or if a merchant's system is still storing card data uh, today. So the liability ultimately of a breach um, still exists. This is a first good step, but um, it's by no means a security solution. Now the good news is, is that there are uh, solutions to address that and we've talked about it already in this tokenization. So Dave, from an underwriting point of view, when you look at a merchant now, mm -hmm. are you asking questions about EMV adoption? Are you looking at it and um, rating them as a better risk if they've done some adoption? What, what are your criteria for looking at this issue when you're, when you're uh, underwriting a risk uh, in the retail space? Okay, so we, we, still, we still take a look at retail as a holistic approach. So uh, Chris, Dave, and, and, and Dave, uh, um, Dave Heron also spoke about it, that it's, it's, it's a fraud solution and not necessarily uh, re reduces risk overall because one thing, as they both mentioned, is that data is still stored on the network and still transactioned. What happens is that uh, the, the targets tend to tend to shift. So from, from a carrier perspective, if you're looking at, you know, books of business exposure across market segments, the bad guy's eyes just shift to a different, uh, a different avenue or, or a different part of it. So if the EMV is there, and your first part of the question is yes, we look at it favorably. We, we think um, they've absorbed the cost, um, they've made it part of their solution, and then the second part is what have they done now that they have uh, reduce the exposure on the POS card present transaction. Now that that focus is going to be on the card not present transaction, what have they, what have they done to increase that security? Because if, if the eyes of the hacker or the, or, or the thief or whoever is going after it, the, the money's just in a different spot. So if the money, if the eyes go to, to where the money, excuse me, if the eyes go to where the money is now held, they need to increase their their risk management and their procedures for, for, for that data. So let's talk about what, what, is, what does the actual shift mean and how does it work from a, from a liability standpoint because uh, it does change things. We've talked about the security aspects of EMV and, and how they might improve security. What does the actual EMV liability shift do? And uh, you know, maybe you can start off with what, what was the case before October okay. 1st, and now where are we? What's the new world look like? Okay, so before October 1st, I'll, I'll be, these are general terms. Uh, you can't get caught in the weeds, but before general, uh, excuse me, October 1st, if a, a merchant experienced some fraud due to a card, the issuer was responsible for that. Uh, October 1st is, is a game changer for the retail world. Excuse me, I shouldn't say retail. I mean, credit cards are used in doctor's offices, you use a car dealership, so it, it's really um, you know, prevalent through the U.S. economy. But the liability now, as of October 1st, comes into a, a, a few different scenarios. So the first scenario is, uh, say, as of today, um, the merchant does not have an EMV uh, POS system and there's a fraudulent transaction, the merchant is now responsible for that transaction. So th that dollar amount shifts from the, from the issuer to the retailer. And in that case, that is a big uh, switch because now that, that those dollars are, are assumed uh, on the P&L by the merchant. The other scenario that happens is if the retailer does have EMV, but the bank does not have the chip in the card, that liability switches to the issuer. I use bank and, and issuer uh, interchange, but switch back to the, uh, to the issuer. That's, that's big. The, the third scenario is a little bit complicated and worries me from, from an underwriter carrier perspective is the yet to be determined. So if the, um, if the retailer or POS system has EMV and the issuer card has EMV, the, the cost of that fraud can go to the person who is technically the less risky or has a less secure standards in, in that transaction. And that's the part that, that worries me a little bit as an underwriter because it, it can be a contest of an argument between an issuing bank and a POS system uh, retailer where we have arguments between people in the gray area whose system is more secure. So, and Dave, just to make sure we hammer the point home here. so. When we talk about the shift, we're talking about a certain type of liability that the merchant is no longer responsible for, potentially, or, or maybe they will be responsible for it, depending on what technology they've used. But 
what, what, it, what is the actual, it's, I think it's chargeback liability that we're talking about in this case, not fines, penalties, and assessments. Can you explain the, how that works a little bit? Yeah, so w w when we talk about the liability in this case, what, you know, kind of using a real example is if a fake card is used at a POS terminal today, uh, actually let's take before October 1, if a fake card is used at a, at a terminal and the merchant allows that transaction to go through, and the person who's the real card holder looks at their statement and says, I didn't do that transaction, they charge it back, meaning they call their bank and say, that's not my transaction. And the amount of that transaction um, is pushed back to the merchant and they bear the, the loss of having done that fraudulent transaction. What this EMV liability shift is really doing is this is a mandate by the networks, Visa, MasterCard, what have you, to incent merchants to adopt EMV and by doing, by the liability shift in this case is this mandate is to say, uh, if you don't have the more secure EMV method, you will bear the risk of that fraud. And prior to October 1st, merchants didn't have to worry about it um, as much, but now they're gonna be forced to eat a lot of these, these costs um, and, and this, these fraudulent so, charges. I think, I think the, the million dollar question is, is, is this really an incentive to switch to EMV? I mean, I, you know, perhaps for bigger, you know, box store retailers where they have a lot of transactions, a lot of chargeback loss and liability, yes, but what about smaller merchants, middle market? Is this actually going to encourage them to shift to this other system? And that's really the challenge, is small merchants um, in particular are challenged with the cost of upgrading their systems uh, versus how much fraud they actually have. You know, somebody operating a, a small convenience store that sells everyday spend products there's not a lot of chargebacks on that. There's not, you know, maybe not a lot of fraud there. And if the fraud, you know, they would otherwise have to, to bear um, doesn't exceed the, the amount it's going to take to upgrade their systems, that might not actually, this liability shift might not be very compelling to them. Um, you know, but what we see across the, the industry as a whole, if you look at payments, you know, the large retailers have, have adopted this because, um, you know, that's where the majority of transactions are, their fraud costs are potentially higher, um, and, and the cost benefit, you know, weighs in favor of them upgrading their systems. But for the smaller merchants, it remains to be seen whether or not on an individual basis, based on the type of merchant, the amount of fraud that they would risk incurring, and the cost it's going to take to upgrade their systems, whether or not it makes sense for them. Um, you know, frankly, some of them may just, um, you know, upgrade their terminals for the purpose of going to tokenization, and EMV really isn't the compelling factor. Uh, because by doing so, they de-risk themselves of having any card data in that case. But, you know, it remains to be seen um, how those small merchants are going to react. So, on that point, uh, some of the card brands have sort of sweetened the pot and added some additional incentives beyond the chargeback liability shift. And, and uh, Dave Malatano, can you mm -hmm. talk about uh, Visa's program and, and some of the sweeteners they put into the pot? relative to assessments as well as PCI validation. Sure, um, so, so everyone knows Visa is really one of the, uh, the leaders in this. So obviously they're the largest, the largest brand. So they kind of, they assess the largest fees and so they can, the rules that they set is usually precedent setting. So this is part of um, uh, the overall view of EMV, but it's really just, you know, the fraud and the PCI compliance are really two different aspects of, of a PO system transaction. So we, we talked about the, the fraud, but it's really, it, again, yet to be determined, but if the, if the merchant generates 95% of, of the transactions using EMV, it is eliminated. The fraud and their, and their fine is eliminated. So from an insurer, excuse me, from an insurer perspective, we see that as, as as large in that way because there is a lot of assessments done after a large breach. Uh, the PCI compliance, now that, that is difficult um, uh, to get for a large retailer because they usually have to use uh, an outside third party vendor to say they're PCI compliant. But w what happens here is that if they process at least 75 of their, excuse me, 75% of them of their transactions, um, they, that waves that also. So I, I say that in a you know, more positive way is that so pricing can change, underwriting can change, but um, in these, these eliminations are, are good for the industry from a carrier perspective. Um, 
again, I kind of, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer all the time, but, but we, we have to look at it is that this still has yet to be determined or yet to be um, precedent setting, but the precedent, uh, once it's set, will be very, very good for the industry. So re reducing of this liability is, is very good for the retail POS. So you get to make the point clear, uh, if uh, under certain programs, MasterCard, Visa, and some of the car brands are putting in place, if, if a company had adopts EMV and complies with their EMV compliance program, if they suffer a completely unrelated data breach, uh, the assessments associated with that, the fraud assessment, the operating expense assessment, uh, could be, would be waived. So I think we saw some huge ones, for instance, in Target, uh, you know, 40, 50 million dollar type things. If, they, if this program had existed uh, prior to that and Target was EMV, EMV compliant, those assessments may not have been uh, assessed ultimately or been waived. Now, you know, it's possible uh, and ultimately that even if there aren't assessments that the banks, the issuing banks will potentially sue the merchant directly, that's still a route to recovery, but it's much more difficult to sue uh, as opposed to using the, the card brand's assessment process to recover some of the fraud on these cards. So uh, I, that's a huge kind of game changer in terms of liability for the merchants and ultimately the carriers that cover them. On the validation point, um, it can be very expensive to validate your compliance uh, from a PCI perspective. And uh, again, if you meet certain criteria under Visa's program, that requirement is waived as well. So uh, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think, I think uh, all the Dave's covered everything perfectly. Okay, great. <laughs> um, all right, switching gears to the final segment here. Uh, third party liability and uh, essentially talking about companies and organizations that impact the security of car processing environments and sometimes potentially cause the breach and what we're seeing in terms of their responsibility in this process. So we'll actually lead uh, with Dave Heron to describe who are the players in this ecosystem, the third parties that are touching cardholder data who may be a risk for merchants and, and ultimately carriers. Yeah. So when we talk about third parties in this case, we're really talking about um, many different players that interact with a merchant or their systems in order to support their payment activities. And they kind of break down into, into two buckets. Those um, sort of vendors that uh, integrate POS systems or payment applications um, for a merchant, and then those that secure their environment or, or support the infrastructure of, of merchants. Um, uh, data processing needs, so your firewall providers and things like that. Um, and if you think about those two buckets, it may, it, it's really a lot of different providers that fit into those categories. And, and the, the problem is, is it's a lot of these players that you find are the common point of the root cause of many breaches. Um, improperly integrated and established um, POS systems, improperly um, set up um, uh, payment applications or gateways or connectivity or uh, firewall patches that haven't been done. All, you know, all, all the sorts of things that are very complicated that merchants will outsource to other providers and hope that it gets done correctly and oftentimes it doesn't and that becomes the root cause uh, of a breach to allow somebody to, to get in and get the data. Um, you know, so this, this sort of these third parties and how they're managed uh, by merchants, how they're identified it, what due diligence is done on them, and then how are they managed ongoing um, is pretty critical to understanding what the liability to a particular merchant may be. So on that count, the, the PCI Council and, um, has, has put together some requirements to look at some of these issues. Uh, Chris, can you talk about what the Council is concerned about and, and what they're doing to try to shore up this third party issue? Yeah, so uh, as was mentioned, I think one of the biggest things we see there is on that kind of uh, integrator, reseller, installer side of things when it comes to these breaches. And to be honest, it tends to affect merchants more in the kind of smaller to mid-size range. The larger organizations generally are doing all this kind of, you know, integration and setup configuration and the like, usually themselves, they usually have their own team to do that. So it's usually the smaller to medium-sized folks. And basically what the council and the card brands are, are attempting to do is try to get these integrators and installers to essentially sign on to a PCI program. You see there the PCI Qualified Integrator Program. Basically, the idea is right now, there's not really a relationship between the card brands, the banks, the council, and the integrators. No. 
So for the most part, all of the relationships, it goes from merchant to the merchant's bank, and the merchant's bank has a relationship with the card brands, and that's pretty much how all of the communications and the requirements and, and things like that flow. So all of these integrators and third parties generally live kind of in the periphery on the outside, and to the extent that they have a relationship with anybody, it's really just because they have a relationship with a merchant or several merchants. Um, so the idea here is to get them into the fold, get them enrolled, educate them so that they know kind of the do's and don'ts from a PCI standpoint. Your bigger companies are probably already doing most things right. It's usually more of the smaller and medium-sized integrators, a lot of your local and regional players that are usually areas where we see kind of things a little bit, um, a little bit slippery. Uh, but that's, that's the intent of it is to get them into the fold so that they can be aware of what those requirements are. Because also another big thing is a lot of the merchants will hire one of these organizations assuming or expecting they already know what's required. And we hear this time and again when we do a breach investigation, I hired so-and-so because they sell point-of-sale systems or they install point-of-sale systems, so I assumed they knew what PCI was and that I didn't have to be bothered. And we come to find out that whoever it was that they sent, they, they really just didn't have any ideas to what the requirements were, and, and so it got set up improperly. So, so Dave, on the underwriting side, when you're going, Dave Maltano, sorry. Um, when you go in and look at a, a retailer or a merchant, to what extent are you looking at the third parties they deal with? Uh, a, a lot. So th there's, you know, that's the cause of a lot of breaches. I think we've just, it, it's public knowledge how some of the big box retailers were, were, were gotten into, and, the, and it, was, it was brought up yesterday too, is that when um, hackers get into an organization, sometimes um, they don't really need to get to the POS system to get into the system. They just, and I think Chris spoke about it too, Chris Day spoke about it yesterday too, is that you know, they're just finding another avenue in there. So that is actually, uh, I'm glad as an underwriter, uh, you can start asking more questions and get the contracts with the vendors to read. So it has become Are you looking at the, uh, the integrators, the guys, who's the company that set up the systems in particular, or just the companies that host the data? What, who, who are you most concerned about in the, in the third party world when it comes to touching the credit card environment? Well, as an, uh, as an underwriter, you're concerned about them all. So there, there's, there's a, you know, a, um, you know, speed to business, speed to market. There is the, the path of least resistance for, for an insured. Um, but yeah, you, you will try to get as much information as you can up front and either do a conference call or something else, figure out what you're doing. The proof is in the pudding. So if we, if, if we see uh, the vendor contracts, look at their vendor approval process, um, I think that's all the time. That's all the time now that you're going to be allowed to review. It'd be nice to get more, um, but there is a speed to business that can, that can and happen. And one thing that. also, if I could just add to that too, so it's beyond to just the point of sale integrators too. So I, I was kind of touching on that more heavily because of we see a lot of risk there for the small and medium size. But in, in the new standards process, that's really focusing on third parties that even don't have any access to payment card data. So it used to be that they wanted you to go through and kind of itemize and look at all the vendors that specifically you know, stored, processed, handled, touched, what have you, that payment card data. Now they're basically asking you to look at any third party of any kind, right? You know, we hear about you know a retailer that had a breach through their HVAC vendor. You can bet their HVAC vendor had no access to credit card data or shouldn't have, mm. but that's still how the breach materialized. And so I think that that's kind of an interesting kind of um, way that they're starting to look at it and kind of expanding the horizon. Because a lot of times when we go into breach investigations, we usually ask the organization, "Are you doing two-factor authentication? Do you have logging in place?" And a lot of them will say very proudly, "Yes, we have that." And then when we start doing the investigation, we find out, well, when they said, yes, they have that, there should have been a little footnote with an asterisk at the bottom that says, yes, we have that for 10% of our users. The other 90% are completely exposed. They don't use two-factor at all. Um, so we see a lot of things like that, so I can understand why a lot of the, the folks in the industry are kind of starting to widen the way that they look at that. So the, the types of attacks that I see in a lot of breaches uh, involve integrators making almost simple mistakes around mm -hmm. remote access uh, that allow easy uh, kind of access to a point of sale system, online shopping carts that are not secure. Can you just talk a little bit about what you see and kind of how those mistakes seem so simple to fix, yet they're prevalent in most of the breaches, especially middle market that we see? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the IT integrator mistakes, I think we, we kind of covered that. The big piece, the remote access, I mean, honestly, I, I, I just don't understand why organizations aren't going down that road, you know, uh, pretty quickly um, already. Um, the online shopping cart, that's an interesting thing because we're seeing most of that happening outside the U.S. 
Um, and a lot of that is because of the fact that most of the soft targets in the, inside the U.S. are still the point of sale, at least until we get more adoption of EMV and, and tokenization and, and things like that. So most of what we see, I mean, to be honest, if we were to kind of show you a pie chart of our kind of investigative caseload, you'd see that, you know, when you look at it just from a PCI standpoint, obviously we handle a lot that's not PCI, but if you just look at the PCI pie chart, you'd see the U.S. is probably... I don't know, 75% point of sale, 25% e-commerce breaches. And then when you go to the rest of the world, the pie chart flips completely the reverse and it's almost no point of sale breaches and almost entirely e-commerce and shopping cart. And a lot of it also is you have a lot of organizations out there that they don't do any vetting whatsoever when they bring someone on board to do their shopping cart. They say, hey, I just, I just went, outside, uh, went online and Googled for a shopping cart application, found the cheapest one I could find, and that's who I signed up with. And then lo and behold, that is just, you know, again, it goes back to whether or not that vendor even understands what those requirements are. It's just some guy who said, hey, you know what, I can write a shopping cart. And he does. And unfortunately, it has no concept with respect to the PCI security controls. And you start running into problems. And then the area where it gets even more complex is when you start to see it become more kind of aggregated or systemic. You have that provider that is now providing that shopping cart service on a shared system for hundreds or thousands of merchants. Now when there's a breach, you know, it's one merchant that might have suffered the initial breach, but hundreds or thousands that might have been, you know, consequently damaged. So and I, and I see that a lot too uh, when I get data breaches in. The, to handle them as a breach coach, uh, there'll be some sort of vulnerability. Uh, you'll get the sense of that in the first couple of calls you get, and then there's almost a wave of other companies that start getting breached at the same time because the hackers basically, once they find the vulnerability, they exploit it across the entire internet Once, if they can find the shopping cart vulnerability across that uh, the spectrum. So That's uh, not, uh, to, just, to, to reiterate, that's not just really just retail. I mean, healthcare is going through the same thing. So one of the things that's, that's kind of happened al already is that a lot of the underwriting questions that's happened to retail has switched to healthcare. Because obviously a healthcare vendor now is, I would say, almost to a greater extent Use, use third party services. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so the commonality and aggregation risk definitely can play, play a role here. Uh, so Dave Heron, um, when, when, a merch, or when a third party actually is responsible for the breach or maybe is hosting the credit card data or hosting the shopping cart, what are the challenges in actually trying to investigate that breach and deal with the third party merchant, I'm sorry, service provider um, after they've been breached? Yeah, I mean, it's it, you, you really think about this in like three different challenges that uh, a merchant has with respect to one of these third parties if there's a breach. The, the first is um, notification itself. Um, you know, there's a good example that was just given that, you know, some of these shopping cart providers may provide services to thousands of merchants. And um, a merchant A may be the one that wasn't uh, breached, but they're affected by a breach that started with another merchant because you use this common shopping cart vendor. Well, you may not know that your data has been exposed or been breached for some period of time. And what obligations does that third party have to promptly notify you of that? Um, the second piece is investigation itself. What kind of cooperation are you going to get from your third party? Um, you know, a lot of times, if, if this is a really catastrophic breach, they're on the ropes and you, know, you may not get the cooperation you need. Or you're just one of a number of different customers that is asking for information from them and they're overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of, of, of the breach of their particular system and the amount of claims being presented to them. And then lastly, you've got liability, is, is what is the merchant's um, contractual right to seek li uh, indemnity for the liability associated with that particular action? And what's the financial wherewithal of this third party even weather the storm? Do they have insurance? You know, are they a startup that you know, got to market quicker than everybody else, but they don't have two pennies to rub together? You know, so I, I think those are, you've got some pretty significant challenge depending on the type of party that um, that you may have a merchant that uh, connects with. So, so Dave Malatano, on, on the issue of these kind of common vulnerabilities and aggregation, uh, when you're looking at retailers across your book, are you kind of saying, oh, they all use, you know, demandware uh, as their, their shopping cart or their e-commerce company? And if, you know, are you worried about kind of that risk and one breach hitting everyone in the retail space or e-commerce space they are dealing with? Uh, yes. So in, in general, I can only talk for us. So we, we keep track of... Uh, for two reasons. One, reinsurers know. So as, as they spoke about yesterday about a cyber hurricane in, in, in the modeling, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, modeling panel is that um, aggregation is scary. So if you, we're starting to see now uh, the people that write the code for the shopping cart are asking for larger and larger limits of liability because they know if they're hacked, they're going to be their code is in so many systems that that makes all their clients vulnerable. So yes, we, we definitely look at that. We keep track of that. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, it's very manual, but it's at least something so we can see who's using what um, and, and and see if there's an issue. Now it hasn't come. It hasn't really happened yet in the market where I haven't seen it or, or we haven't done it where someone will say similar earthquake insurance or wind and hail not to not not to change what we do but you know I haven't seen anyone saying all right we we write you know all the houses along the Florida coast we have enough aggregation exposure I haven't seen yet in the marketplace where they say no we already insure um, you know 50 customers of the of the software company we can't you use them we can't insure you uh, will it go there? I, I don't, it, it's tough to make predictions, but at least people, I know people are keeping track of that too. That's a long answer to your question of yes, but um, uh, people are keeping track of it because it is, it is an exposure, an aggregation issue. So one of the trends I've seen uh, and I'm involved in uh, on some level is now um, the merchants who have to pay the fines, penalties, and assessments uh, all of a sudden are seeing that, oh, this really wasn't, shouldn't have been my problem. This is my service provider who failed to have dual factor authentication for the remote access or use the admin password for remote access. Um, I, wanna, I want them to pay this. Um, and so I'm actually handling a couple matters now where we're going after the, um, the application provider or other companies who, uh, the integrator, whoever it may be, who caused the breach. So uh, there may be a trend from the merchant and potentially from the insurer point of view for uh, seeking subrogation against some of these third parties who ultimately cause the breach. Um, so there are, this is an example, you know, the, the application provider could be the one going, you, know, you go after the web hosting company, uh, the integrators, the security companies that failed to secure the organization properly, maybe even the QSA, the Qualified Security Assessor who gave a company a, a clean bill of health during the PCI assessment. All of these third parties are, are gonna be in play and the more and more liability that the merchants face, the more they're going to seek to pass that on to these types of third parties. And, and again, we're already seeing it in many cases. I've even seen cases where um, you know the insurance broker E and O uh, has been triggered for failure to procure adequate cyber insurance in, in some of these merchant cases for fines, penalties, and assessments. Um, so at the end of the day, once the merchant kind of settles everything out, uh, third-party targets may be coming into play, uh, and there may be seeming more litigation there. The, the downside and irony of, of some of this is that um, many of the carriers who insure the merchants for data breach also insure the point of sale integrators, application developers for E and O. So uh, that could be interesting to see how that works itself out. Um, just a quick slide. These are some of the theories of liability that might apply uh, in, in some of the cases against some of these third parties. Uh, at the end of the day, really, though, it's the contract that's going to be the most mm. important and what rights and uh, obligations do the service providers uh, have and what liabilities are they responsible for under the contract between the merchant and the service provider. So if you're a merchant trying to um, shift some of this liability, you have to start thinking about that when you're actually entering into the relationship, entering into the contract with that third party. So that uh, ends our, our overall session, but I think we do have some time for some Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, please step up to the mic so we can uh, hear you and uh, we'd be happy to answer them. She's been waiting a while. <laughs> Hi guys, Susan Young from Marsh. Just a quick question for Chris. If a merchant is doing the tokenization in house, does it make a difference on who holds the key? So yeah, if, if a merchant is doing tokenization in-house, then, then generally, depending on the method of tokenization they're, they're, they're utilizing, generally that means they are holding the key, so they are usually the one that's using some in-house system. There's usually a tokenization system that they use to tokenize that data, and then after that it passes through tokenized. There are also uh, merchant processors that will do kind of embedded tokenization. So for example, if you install their hardware at your point of sale, it will tokenize the data right from there all the way through your environment. So none of your systems will actually have the key or be able to get to that ultimate pan. So it depends a lot on the methodology that an organization is using to tokenize the data. 
Any other questions? Can you step up the mic, please? So based on everything we've heard so far in the last couple of days, it's all about the users making mistakes, right? So am I missing something? It seems like this new shift towards the merchants shifts the liability to the people less, the least prepared to deal with it, which is all the people you know working at Starbucks, working at these places, they're now going to have to be doing the due diligence. Is that a correct assessment? I think you're still... Uh, from that, I think Starbucks is still liable to give the people the tools they need to be compliant. So there's still a business perspective of of the, the point of sales. In this case, the card present transactions of Starbucks providing the the actual hardware and tools for the people to use the systems. Uh, yeah, because Starbucks is a huge retailer. Maybe that's not a good example. So what about the millions of yeah. of other ones where? You know, suddenly the person who's you know, normally taking the transaction who doesn't even look on the back of the card, essentially they're the ones responsible now, right? Yeah, that, that could get down to an employment-related issue. If that company, are you talking about that company holding that cashier responsible for the re fraudulent transaction? I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, th I think yeah. it's a reflection of, of the adoption that we talked about that, you know, to your point, some of the, the least sophisticated merchants are the ones that will be the last ones without a chair when the music stops, um, you know, but the, the, the shift is about, you know, trying to uh, create enough, um, you know, groundswell or forward momentum where you got more and more of these merchants switching to EMV no and, and, it be, and it becomes no choice where to, you know, to be in business, to be a, a, a you know, uh, a merchant that's well regarded, uh, you, you're going to have to be like everybody else. And if everybody else is doing EMV, then that's what your mandate needs to be. I think the other thing also to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, it, EMV really focuses on the reduction of counterfeit fraud, right? So when you look at it, I think probably the biggest interest is getting the large, the large merchants on board and the merchants that, um, I don't know if I want to say, sell expensive things, because that's generally where the majority of the fraud happens, right? Most people aren't going online to the black market to buy a fraudulent card to go buy a sandwich. If they're going to get a fraudulent card, they're going to go out and buy a big screen TV with it. So I think for the most part, I want to say that the small merchants are safe, but I think the small merchants probably tend to see less of that fraud because people aren't going to buy low dollar items with fraudulent cards, generally speaking. If they do, it's for test transactions to see if their fraudulent it cards works. are working. Yeah. So I think we're over time, but we uh, thank everyone for uh, listening to our, our uh, presentation, and uh, we'll be up here for a couple minutes if you have questions. Thank you.